Tan Sri Abdul Wahid Omar, Chairman of Pursa Malaysia Berhad, MICPA Council members, event sponsors, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Council, I bid you a very good morning and a warm welcome to MICPA's 63rd anniversary commemorative lecture. I hope each one of you has been staying safe and coping well during these challenging times. We're very pleased to be able to gather colleagues, friends and associates within the accounting fraternity and beyond on this platform to listen to a captivating speaker on a topic that is fast becoming so important and is no more a buzzword amongst fellow professionals today. I would like to thank our sponsors who have faithfully supported the Institute over the years and appreciate their commitment to making today's event a success. The commemorative lecture has been an annual tradition and a key event held by MICPA. The various themes chosen always reflect the objects of the Institute, which are to develop and uphold the highest standard of accounting education and practice. I'm proud to say that our members have remained steadfast in maintaining technical excellence in what they do. In line with Institute's 63rd anniversary this week, we are truly glad to be able to celebrate it with you at this event. The lectures have become the summit event in the Institute's annual calendar, as they provide an opportunity for us to evaluate the most pertinent issues affecting the Malaysian economic environment and the role of the accounting profession therein. Over the years, we have had eminent speakers share their perspectives on current topical issues, which is a strong indication and a clear testimony to the importance accorded to this annual event. This year's lecture will be the first one held without a luncheon and the first one held virtually, something we will all have to accept as a norm in these interesting times. However, we are pleased that we are able to have a much wider audience joining us from various locations, even outside of Malaysia. Now on behalf of the MICPA Council, allow me to express our heartfelt gratitude to Tan Sri Abdul Wahid Omar for making the time to address our distinguished audience today. We truly appreciate his support towards the Institute and the profession over the years and are honored to have him here with us. Tan Sri Abdul Wahid will be speaking on ESG, Islamic finance and the accountancy profession, the way forward, which I think is an excellent and relevant topic for all those in attendance, as our profession is best suited to support organizations in responding to investor demands for ESG information and ultimately improve the management and reporting of ESG performance, as well as assist in driving Islamic finance further ahead. Accounting professionals are indeed a uniquely qualified batch, bunch of people who can help organizations to increase stakeholder trust and confidence. Without a doubt, today's lecture is going to be a thought provoking one, and I look forward to hearing from Tan Sri Abdul Wahid, who has been at the forefront of the government's economic policies, as well as someone with a strong background in the corporate world. Please do feel free to ask questions on the topic at hand, and we will try our best to address them during the Q&A session at the end of Tan Sri's lecture. Before I invite Tan Sri Abdul Wahid to present the commemorative lecture, allow me first to introduce him. Tan Sri Abdul Wahid Omar is currently the chairman of Bursa Malaysia Berhad and University Kabangsa An Malaysia. He's regarded as one of the most versatile corporate leaders in Malaysia, having successfully led four major organizations involved in infrastructure development, telecommunications, financial services, and investment management. He served as group chairman of Pramodalan National Berhad, Malaysia's largest fund management company from August 2016 to June 2018, following completion of his term as a senator and Minister in the Prime Minister's Department in charge of economic planning from June 2013 to June 2016. Prior to his cabinet appointment, Tan Sri Abdul Wahid was the President and CEO of Maybank, Malaysia's largest public listed company, 
and one of the leading banking groups in Southeast Asia from May 2008. He was credited with transforming Maybank into a regional banking group and a global leader in Islamic finance. Prior to joining Maybank, he was the group CEO of Telecom Malaysia Berhad from July 2004 until his demerger with Axiata Group Berhad in April 2008. He was also formerly the MD and CEO of UEM Group Berhad, his first role as CEO at the ripe old age of 37. He successfully led the turnaround of UEM Group, Malaysia's largest infrastructure development conglomerate, following his takeover by the Sovereign Wealth Fund, Kazana National, in 2001. Tansri Abdul Wahid is a member of the Association of Chartered Certified Accountants, the Institute of Chartered Accountants in England, Wales, and the Malaysian Institute of Accountants. He has received numerous awards throughout his career. This includes Malaysia's CEO of the Year 2006 award from Business Times and American Express, the Asian Bankers 2013 Leadership Achievement Award for Malaysia, and the Edge Value Creator Award 2013. He was also awarded the Honorary Doctorate in Economy from Multimedia University of Malaysia in 2014 and the Honorary Doctorate in Economy and Mobile Administration by the Islamic Science University of Malaysia in 2018. Tan Abdul Wahid currently serves as a trustee of WWF Malaysia, Professor of Practice at NCF, and is a visiting fellow at the Oxford Centre for Islamic Studies UK. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Yang Berbahagia Tan Sri Abdul Wahid Omar. Thank you, Dr. Verinda. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Yang berbahagia, Dr. Verinda Jit Singh, President of the Malaysian Institute for Certified Public Accountants, MIPA Council members, fellow accountants, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And a very good morning. Let me begin by congratulating MIPA on its 63rd anniversary. And thank you for inviting me to deliver this commemorative lecture. At 63 years old, MIGPA is relatively young compared to ICAEW at 141 years and ACCA at 116 years old. But I must say, MIGPA has grown in its global reputation with its mutual recognition MOU with CANS back in 2009, MIGPA's 3,200 members are now part of the larger Chartered Accountants in Australia and New Zealand Network of 128,000 financial professionals working alongside other chartered accountancy bodies in advancing the accountancy profession for the greater good of businesses and the broader economy. I must say, I always feel good being in the company of fellow accountants, albeit virtually this time. After all, this is the profession that has enabled many of us to earn a decent living. Born as the ninth child in a family of 11 siblings, I remember asking my teachers and the elders which profession would make most money. Well, they told me accountants make a lot of money. And since I was good in maths, I wanted to be an accountant too and take the family out of poverty. Alhamdulillah, with Mara scholarship, I graduated from ACCA in 1987, became a member of MIA in 1998, and later, with the encouragement of your MIGPA Vice President, Datuk Ganati, I became a member of ICAW in 2015 at the ripe age of 51. As an accountant, my ultimate ambition was to be a Chief Financial Officer of a major public research company. Alhamdulillah, I got there in March 2001 when I was appointed as the Chief Financial Officer of Telecom Malaysia. I never imagined I would go on to be CEO of three major organizations, perform national service in the cabinet for one term of three years before returning to the corporate sector. Apart from my current role at Brusa Malaysia, I'm truly privileged to be, to be able to contribute in the area of education at UKM, our national university, as chairman of the board of directors, 
at, C at NCF, the Global University for Islamic Finance, as a professor of practice and as a visiting fellow at the Oxford Center for Islamic Studies. I'm also fortunate to be involved in nature conservation as a trustee of the Worldwide Fund for Nature Malaysia. With such interest and exposure in accountancy, conventional and Islamic finance, capital markets and sustainability, and with a growing awareness on climate change globally, it should not be a surprise that the title of my lecture this morning is on ESG, Islamic finance, and the accountancy profession, the way forward. Please allow me to share my perspectives in four parts. First, on climate change and the global commitment to accessibility. Second, on developments in Islamic finance and ESG. Third, on commonalities between Islamic finance and ESG. And fourth, the role of the accountancy profession. Ladies and gentlemen, we all know how catastrophic COVID-19 has been globally over the past year and a half. It is causing substantial disruptions to, to the global economy, undermining the resilience and well-being of society, especially in terms of loss of lives and livelihood. COVID-19 has caused more than 4 million lives lost to date, and as many as 150 million being pushed into extreme poverty by 2021, according to the World Bank. Malaysia is not spared, with poverty incidence rate increasing from 5.6% in 2019 to 8.4% in 2020 due to the pandemic. Climate change, if not addressed appropriately, will similarly be catastrophic. According to a stress test by the Swiss Re Institute, the world economy could shrink by 18% in the next 30 years if no mitigation action is taken against climate change. Just two weeks ago, on 15 July 2021, our economic minister, Dr. Sri Mustafa Muhammad, presented Malaysia's Voluntary National Review 2021 at the United Nations High-Level Political Forum on Sustainable Development. The minister reported that Malaysia has been successful in several aspects of the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals 2030, or UN SDGs. These include achievements in economic growth, public health care, environmental sustainability, public safety, and international relations. However, there are also many challenges to be addressed to achieve the 2020 2030 goals, including in addressing malnutrition, increasing burden of public health care, and digital divide, which are currently being addressed by the government. The adverse effects of climate change can undermine past development gains, threaten the prospects for achieving the UN SDGs, and increase the risk of our ecosystems collapsing. A failure to achieve the SDGs will likely negatively affect billions of people worldwide with substantial damage to livelihoods, exacerbating poverty and the spread of diseases. Ladies and gentlemen, for nearly three decades, the UN has been bringing countries together to attend the Global Climate Change Summits called Conference of the Parties or COP. Since then, climate change has evolved from being a fringe issue to becoming a global priority. Come November this year, the UK, in partnership with Italy, will host COP26 in Glasgow. The conference aims to bring together more than 190 world leaders, thousands of negotiators, government representatives, businesses, and citizens to accelerate action towards the goals of the Paris Agreement and the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, or UNFCCC. This involves, among others, the need to secure global net zero by 2050, half net emissions by 2030, and to keep global warming within one and a half degrees centigrade. On the last count, some 127 countries responsible for 38% of global greenhouse gas emissions have pledged to be carbon neutral by 2050. This includes the UK that has set the most ambitious climate change target into law to reduce emissions by 78% by 2035 compared to 1990 levels, building on the earlier target of 68% reduction by 2030. I happened to be in the UK when the G7 summit was held on 11th to 13th June, 2021. Naturally, 
COVID-19 was high on the agenda, followed by climate change and sustainability. The G7 summit concluded with the leaders issuing a communique commenting, among others, to protect our planet by firstly creating a green revolution that creates jobs, cuts emissions, and seeks to limit the rise in global temperatures to within one and a half degrees. Secondly, to commit to net zero no later than 2050, halving collective emissions over two decades to 2030, increasing and improving climate finance to 2025, and to conserve or protect at least 30% of our land and oceans by 2030. And third, acknowledging our duty to safeguard the planet for future generations. Now closer to home, awareness and efforts to address climate change are gaining momentum in Malaysia with a host of ongoing initiatives. Efforts are being made to develop a climate change legal framework that will support the implementation of the Malaysian climate change commitments under the UNFCCC. In addition, the Malaysian government has put in place many different incentives to ensure Malaysia is on track to meet its commitments under the Paris Agreement and accelerate the transition towards a more resilient and inclusive economy. Last month, on 23rd to 25th June 2021, the Joint Committee on Climate Change, jointly chaired by Banagara Malaysia and the Securities Commission, hosted the flagship conference in Kuala Lumpur, putting climate change and sustainability high on the agenda of the Malaysian government, Banagara Malaysia, the SC, the financial services industry, Bursa Malaysia, and the corporate sector. I must say, it was the most comprehensive conference on climate change and sustainability I have ever attended. Malaysia is expected to ramp up its climate ambitions in addition to the current pledge to reduce its greenhouse gas emission intensity by 45% by 2030, including setting a clear net zero target. It is worth noting that 75% of Malaysia's greenhouse gas emissions are driven by the power and transport sectors, contributing 251 million tons of carbon out of the total 334 million tons based on 2016 data. This large proportion attributable to the energy and transport sectors is common in most developed and developing countries. To achieve the global target of net zero by 2050, countries among others would need to commit to firstly, accelerate the phase out of coal and encourage investment in renewable energy. Secondly, to optimize energy demand and speed up the switch to electric vehicles. And third, to curtail further this deforestation. Now, to speed up the transition to net zero will require significant funding from both public and private finances. And this will involve developed countries honoring their promise to mobilize at least 100 billion US dollars in climate finance per year and trillions more in private finance to secure global net zero by 2050. And this will naturally create demand for sustainable finance moving forward. And this brings us to the second part of my address on developments in Islamic finance and ESG. Based on the Islamic Finance Development Report 2020 by the Islamic Corporation for the Development of the Private Sector or ICD and Refinitiv, the 2020 total Islamic finance assets globally stood at 2.9 trillion US dollars. Due to COVID-19 pandemic, the overall value of Islamic finance assets did not grow significantly in 2020. However, it is expected to rebound and grow at the compounded annual growth rate of 6% from 2020 to reach 3.7 trillion US dollars come 2024. The growth was driven by continued growth in Islamic banking assets, which stood at 2 trillion US dollars, representing 69% of total Islamic finance assets. The growth was, was also driven by the elevated levels of super issuance in the traditional markets of GCC and Southeast Asia, besides the growing global popularity of green and ESG suku. The value of suku assets stood at 538 billion US dollars, representing 19% of total Islamic finance assets. The pandemic has also been a game changer in driving several Islamic financial institutions to move their products onto the digital platform. 
On the Islamic asset management industry front, total Islamic assets under management increased some 29.8% to 102.3 billion US dollars in 2019. These assets are mostly domiciled in Saudi Arabia, Malaysia, and Iran, which collectively make up 81.5% of the total assets under management. But Islamic asset under management is still small relative to sustainable investment and ESG driven assets of 38 trillion US dollars in 2019. Sustainable investing, also called responsible investing or values based investing, involves incorporating environmental, social, and governance factors when making investment decisions rather than purely on financial considerations. Today, sustainable investment has transformed from niche products into mainstream capital market offerings as more discerning investors shift towards climate friendly activities to minimize their impact on the planet. Over the years, financial market participants have gained a better understanding of the value proposition of incorporating ESG considerations in asset allocations and recognize the potential in the increasing client demand for values-based investing. Based on a recent Deutsche Bank GSIE analysis, assets with ESG mandate is expected to reach 160 trillion US dollars by 2036. This would mean close to 100% ESG integration into fund management. Now, many of these initiatives are driven by the United Nations Principles for Responsible Investments, or UNPRI. The six PRIs are a voluntary and aspirational set of investment principles that offer a menu of possible actions for incorporating ESG issues into investment practice. These principles were developed by investors for investors. And the six principles are firstly, that we will incorporate ESG issues into investment analysis and decision-making process. Second, incorporating ESG issues into ownership policies and practices. Third, appropriate disclosure on ESG issues by the entities in which the fund managers invest in. Fourth, promoting acceptance and implementation of the principles within the investment industry. Fifth, working together to enhance effectiveness in implementing the principles. And sixth, reporting on activities and progress towards implementing the principles. The list of UNPRI signatories is growing rapidly, now with more than 4,000 institutions signed up today. This reinforces the global momentum for ESG investing, where all institutional funds will eventually only invest in companies that are ESG compliant in the future. Likewise, this global movement towards sustainability and ESG is also being supported by financial institutions under the UN principles for responsible banking. Banks like HSBC, for example, have committed to be net zero by 2050. And this includes commitment not to fund coal projects by 2040. Many other banks have made similar commitments, including Maybank and CIMB. Insurers under the UN principles for sustainable insurance are also pledging not to underwrite the risk of non-ESG projects or assets or companies in the future. This global movement towards sustainable financing is also being supported by regulators, such as the development of the climate change and principles-based taxonomy by Benegar Malaysia, as well as the Securities Commission's SRI roadmap, which aims to create a facilitative SRI ecosystem in the mission capital market. The SE chairman has also recently announced plans to release a public consultation paper on SRI taxonomy by the end of 2021 to provide more clarity and guidance in, identify, in identifying sustainable investment assets or activities. This will facilitate greater product diversity and accelerate the development of SRI as an asset class. It is therefore important for corporates to embed sustainability in their business strategy and operations. Companies that choose to ignore sustainability or ESG consideration in their business will not be sustainable as they will be deprived of both equity and debt financing to fund their projects. 
insurance will not be there to underwrite some of their risks. And they will also be deprived of the human capital talent necessary to drive their business. Nor will they be able to sell their products as consumers become more discerning in buying only sustainable products in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the basic prerequisites of Islamic asset management is the attainment of the objectives of Sharia or Makassid al Sharia to facilitate the normal functioning of society by enhancing public good or maslaha. It involves the protection of faith or religion, protection of life, intellect, lineage, and property, and forbids activities that are harmful to human beings, society, and the environment. ESG investing or sustainable investing refers to investments that seek positive returns and impact on environment, society, and good governance. It takes into account the behavior of the investing com companies and impact on the three key elements of environment, social, and governance. On environment, dealing with issues like climate change, resource depletion, waste, pollution, and deforestation. On social issues like human rights, modern slavery, child labor, working conditions, and employee relations. And on governance, on issues like bribery and corruption, executive pay, board diversity and structure, political lobbying and donation, and tax strategy. From the description of the Makassi Al Sharia and ESG above, one can clearly see the alignment and commonality between Islamic finance and ESG. Very often, assets, on, assets or instruments which meet with Sharia principles also meet with ESG requirements given the common universe of values. Likewise, the 17 UN SDGs, such as no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, quality education, clean water, sanitation, and climate action are also consistent with the principles of Sharia. What this means is that for as long as the activities of the investing companies are not prohibited by Sharia, such as gambling, alcohol, and weaponry, and the debt or giving level is within the permissible 33% limit, then the prospects for Sharia investing is equally bright compared to ESG investing. Sharia investing, like ESG investing, promotes responsible behavior and appeals to investors seeking products that advocate ethical investing due to the selection criteria for the underlying investments. Investors who are concerned about ESG factors in their investments or are choosing to focus on ESG investing can consider sharing funds as an alternative, as sharing funds can be considered as ESG-based investment. The Sharia ESG funds are also able to generate returns on par with conventional funds or even better. Ladies and gentlemen, as I mentioned earlier in that the issue of sustainability and climate change is now becoming mainstream at both global and national level. And it is certainly getting attention in our profession. If I were to use the articles featured in MIGPAS Mission Accountant Journal, March to April 2021 edition as a yardstick, there were two major articles on sustainability. That is, firstly, managing ESG risk is a matter of short-term pain, long-term gain by Ron Shen. And there was a second article on moving ESG up this decade's business sustainability agenda by Arina Kong. These are two very good articles, I must say. As finance professionals, accountants are expected to play key roles in embedding sustainability in businesses. This may include, among others, primary involvement and responsibility in the following three areas, among others. First, on assessing sustainability and climate change risk affecting the company's strategy and operations. These will need to be addressed at the strategy development stage, uh, for example, looking at long-term trends and others, as well as operational level, for example, change in industry-specific rules and bylaws. Secondly, addressing sustainability and climate change issues throughout the entire supply chain. 
Gone are the days when companies can get away by outsourcing some of their responsibilities or operations to third-party service providers. Likewise, companies can no longer plead ignorance or helplessness when certain labor policies were not within their control. A case in point is the modern slavery acquisitions against some manufacturers and plantation companies. And third, complying with the updated Mission Code on Corporate Governance 2021 and other reporting requirements. The updated MCCG 2021 introduced best practices and guidance to strengthen board oversight and the integration of sustainability considerations in the strategies and operations of companies. Companies with a well-articulated long-term strategy and a clear plan on sustainability, including supporting the global transition to a net zero economy, will distinguish themselves by building the confidence of their stakeholders, for example, consumers, investors, policymakers, and regulators. On the other hand, boards and companies that are not prepared may see their businesses suffer as stakeholders lose confidence in the company's ability to adapt to shifts and challenges and changes in the global landscape. Wearing my Bursa Malaysia hat, as ESG becomes mainstream, it is our hope that more public listed companies will be included in our FTSE for Good Bursa Malaysia Index over time. The index has played an essential role in, in recognizing the index has uh, played um, an essential role in recognizing PLCs that have taken steps to improve their ESG practices and disclosures. Since its launch in 2014, the number of constituents in the index has tripled from 24 to 76. It is important to note that the FTSE for Good framework is mapped out to other global standards, such as the GRI standards. It follows the principles of positive screening with a blanket exclusion applied for manufacturers of tobacco, weapons, and coal. Bursa Malaysia continuously engages with its stakeholders to see if there is a need to incorporate more SRI elements in the ESG index that can better suit our local investment landscape. This has contributed to Bursa Malaysia launching the FTSE for Good Bursa Malaysia Sharia Index on 5th July 2021. This new index currently comprises 54 constituents of the FTSE for Good Bursa Malaysia Index that are Sharia compliant according to the Securities Commission's Sharia Advisory Council screening methodology. Apart from ESG-related indices, Bursa Malaysia has also played a pioneering role in compiling PLCs to adopt a good ESG practice and disclosure. For instance, since the establishment of the Sustainability Reporting Framework back in 2015, all Malaysian public listed companies are now disclosing sustainability statements and reports annually, detailing the governance structure put in place as well as the approach to managing their material sustainability matters, which covers an extensive range of economic, environmental, and social themes. In addition, Bursa Malaysia also supports PLCs along their sustainability journey via the provision of comprehensive guidance and feedback, undertaking various advocacy and training in areas such as climate change and anti-corruption. Our listed issuers also benefit immensely from our Bursa System portal a one-stop knowledge repository for corporate governance, sustainability, and responsible investment. We are heartened to observe significant improvements in sustainability-related practices, such as well as disclosures by our PLCs in recent years. Some of the more progressive ones fully adhere to international best practices, such as the Global Reporting Initiative standards. As we move forward, we can expect ESG reporting will be improved and standardized. In September 2020, the International Business Council of the World Economic Forum, chaired by Mr. Brian Moynihan, the chairman and CEO of Bank of America, in collaboration with the big four audit firms, issued a white paper report on measuring stakeholder capitalism towards common metrics and consistent reporting of sustainable value creation. The report recommends a set of stakeholder capitalism metrics and disclosures, 21 core disclosures and uh, 34 expanded disclosures 
that can be used by its members to align their mainstream reporting on performance against ESG indicators and track their contributions towards the SDGs on a consistent basis. The five leading ESG standard setters, uh, that is the uh, Carbon Disclosure Project, the Climate Disclosure Standards Board, the Global Reporting Initiative, the International Integrated Reporting Council, and the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board also agreed in September 2020 to work together to align their various standards and frameworks. The work of IBC and the five standards starters mentioned just now are fundamentally complementary and could form the natural building blocks of a single coherent global ESG reporting system. Some of you may be asking, why are we doing all this? Well, in the words of the IBC, given the interrelation of economic, environmental, and social factors is increasingly material to long-term enterprise value creation, investors and stakeholders now expect companies to report on non-functional issues, risks, and opportunities with the same discipline and rigor as financial information. By reporting on these recommended metrics in its mainstream report and integrating them into governance, business strategy, and performance management, a company demonstrates to its shoulders and stakeholders all pertinent risks and opportunities of the business are diligently considered. Beyond this, companies that align their goals to the long-term goals of society as articulated in the SDGs are likely to create long-term sustainable value while driving positive outcomes for business, the economy, society, and to the planet. And which profession is best prepared and suited to take on this task? Well, to me, the answer is pretty obvious, the accountancy profession, naturally. Ladies and gentlemen, to tackle the issue of climate change holistically and comprehensively, beyond addressing the energy use and generation in our country, transition towards net zero requires innovations in technology, shifting consumer behaviors, and socio-economic transformations. In this regard, as I mentioned at the GC3 flagship conference on 25th June 2021, I would like to draw your attention to an ongoing joint study by WWF and BCG to explore key building blocks and potential transition pathways for Malaysia to achieve a net zero target. Based on preliminary findings, under the current business as usual pathway, carbon emission levels are expected to double from 75 million tons of carbon equivalent in 2016 to 159 million tons of carbon by 2050. A lower carbon emission pathway will potentially reduce carbon emissions by some 60% in 2050. But to achieve net zero by 2050 will require significant additional efforts. For illustration, the most cost optimal way to reach net zero by 2050 will require 100% electric vehicle penetration, 57% renewables in energy mix, retention of 55% forest cover, that means 18 million hectares in 2050 compared to 18.2 million hectares that we have currently and limited carbon capture utilization and storage requirement. This will require some 350 to 400 billion ringgit cumulative investments, mostly in the energy sector, representing 0.8% of GDP per annum until 2050, which is comparably lower than 1.8% of GDP for Indonesia, 2.1% for China, and 7.4% for India. In terms of benefits, Malaysia's climate transition could generate up to 40 billion ringgit in incremental GDP and 400,000 incremental jobs by 2050. These are preliminary numbers and they are subject to further studies expected to be completed by September 2021. Completing this study will require significant input from all stakeholders. And to this end, I would like to invite all of you, accountants, and all mission corporates to come on board to work together on a possible net zero pathway 
for Malaysia. We are encouraged by some of our biggest companies, such as Petronas, Maybank, and Samdabi, which have stated their net zero ambitions to address the impacts of climate change. We hope these companies can serve as good role models for their peers to emulate. As more asset managers focus on net zero, companies that show both a commitment to lowering their greenhouse gas emissions and targets on how to get there will mostly likely be favored. Ladies and gentlemen, before I end, please allow me to highlight the plight of our national icon, the Malayan tiger, which is critically endangered and on the brink of extinction if no drastic action is taken. As we speak, the number of million tigers has dwindled to less than 200 compared to 500 a decade ago. Let us not repeat the same mistake with the extinction of Sumatran rhinoceros in Malaysia. The last female rhino by the name of Iman sadly died in November 2019, despite efforts to save her. So the rhinos in Malaysia have unfortunately become extinct right here in front of us. Unless drastic actions are taken, the Malayan tiger is facing the same fate. Let us all do what we can to save the Malayan tiger from extinction. And please visit the website of uh, wwf.org.my to find out how you can help save our Malayan tiger. It is my hope that one day our million tigers will thrive in the wild with an abundance of natural prey such that they will not be bothered by the presence of humans anymore. Just like, just like uh, the majestic cheetah at the Serengeti National Park, Tanzania, which was caught on an iPhone camera from a distance of 10 meters. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your attention. I will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Shanta, for the emceeing and uh, now pushing us to the Q&A session. And uh, hopefully we can uh, do justice to the many uh, points that Tansri Wahid had raised. Um, in, in this presentation. So first of all, Tansri, thank you for the uh, overall presentation. Uh, and I think it uh, covered uh, a very wide set of angles. And, um, and this is the latest thing in terms of ESG, climate change. It's no longer a buzzword. It is now a must that corporates have to uh, adopt and, uh, and move on with it. And therefore the accounting profession is very, very well placed. And I hope all the participants listening to this who are accountants to take this on board. And MICP itself is doing uh, various things connected with trying to push this across to our members so that they have some tools available. Let me ask, uh, I had a few questions that already have uh, been received. And let me ask you a simpler one first, maybe, um, and then a bit more difficult one later. Uh, when I say difficult, it doesn't mean it's difficult. It's just that some, some, some of the questions, one or two of the comment, questions are very cynical, but uh, let's address that maybe uh, together. First one is this. How is Malaysia's ESG ranking uh, compared to uh, the Southeast Asian neighbors? How do we rank relatively? Maybe you have some, you have some views on that, Tansri. Well, thank you, Brenda. Um, I think... I don't think we have uh, a measurement uh, which is globally accepted uh, for now, uh, but um, if I can take a few examples, uh, there was one recent study uh, done by Sustainal Sust sorry, Sustainalytics. Um, so uh, they did a survey uh, among the countries in ASEAN uh, and uh, we ranked behind uh, Thailand uh, in the overall progress of PSG. Now, uh, there's uh, one particular website that tracks uh, the overall UN SDG achievements uh, amongst um, various countries in the world. Uh, so in that study, uh, you will find that uh, most developed countries would rank very high uh, with a score of 80% uh, uh, and above. And uh, countries in ASEAN um, rank behind, uh, unfortunately. 
Um, but um, again, uh, among ASEAN countries, I think Sorry about that. Um, sorry. Um, so I was saying that um, there is that uh, um, looking at the UN SDGs, um, where European countries have fed very well, uh, but uh, many Asian countries are lagging behind. Uh, but uh, within the context of ASEAN, uh, typically uh, we uh, rank quite the uh, Visible. So perhaps uh, behind Thailand, uh, as I mentioned. And uh, there's also uh, another study, uh, this is uh, on the ASEAN uh, corporate governance. So this is not ESG broadly, uh, but uh, within the context of governance, uh, I think mission companies uh, fared uh, very well, uh, again, among the top. Uh, so it varies, uh, if I may, uh, Brinda. Okay, thank you. Um, and then there's another question that uh, is very relevant in the context of um, the current pandemic that we are facing, COVID-19. Um, and again, it doesn't mean that it can be answered, but uh, let's just take a stab at this. Um, and the question says, due to COVID the COVID-19 pandemic, many businesses are struggling to survive. And uh, some of them, of course, have already terminated their operations. And I think uh, hospitality, transportation are in a serious state of affairs. So the question, just asks, should companies move away from this focus on ESG, or could ESG help companies bounce back from this dark period? Uh, it's a difficult one, I think, but uh, because it doesn't mean that ESG is the answer. But anyway, uh, perhaps, uh, Tansri, you would like to just see, give your comments on this? Well, thank you, Verinda. I don't think it's mutually exclusive uh, in that sense. Uh, so we do appreciate that many businesses uh, are suffering um, under the current environment. So uh, naturally, uh, whether you are a big corporate entity or medium-sized company or SMEs, um, so most companies have been affected. So naturally, the priority today would be to ensure sustainability of your business. So I think many people have started uh, to save costs um, and make sure uh, that they have enough cash flow to sustain uh, for the next um, few months uh, before the economies uh, reopen again uh, and uh, they can start to re regenerate their cash flow. Uh, so this, this will apply to most, most companies. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they must not prepare uh, for the long-term um, survival um, and uh, growth uh, in the company. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, this uh, global movement towards sustainability uh, is uh, no longer on the fringe, uh, it's mainstream, uh, and something which um, businesses cannot know. Um, I mentioned, um, if you're a public listed company, you can not expect um, institutional investors to invest in you if you don't look after sustainability uh, issues. Uh, likewise, um, banks will not lend to you, um, insurers uh, will be reluctant to insure your assets, or you have to pay a huge premium uh, to ensure your assets or your projects. Um, you can't get human capital. Um, so many of the young generation will not want to work for you um, if you're not um, you know, considered to be sustainable. And certainly uh, the final point will have to be uh, your consumers, your customers. Uh, they will not buy your products if you don't think to count sustainability uh, in your business operations uh, and strategy for sure. Yes, yes, so it's a journey that one has to uh, embark on and, uh, and and move move with the times, as, as you say. Uh, so that let's come back to this point on auditors and uh, how does ESG impact the audit or the field of auditing, and how can auditors equip themselves uh, to add value uh, in uh, terms of um, educating your clients and helping your clients adopt ESG. Well, um, I've always viewed the auditors as being central uh, to uh, this issue uh, in the sense that all businesses, all companies will have to produce financial statements um, and the financial statements uh, will have to be audited. Uh, now, growingly, um, you know, listed companies will be required to produce integrated uh, reports 
uh, and that will include um, uh, reporting on sustainability. Um, so it is an evolving uh, issue and area. Um, as you know, uh, there is that uh, standard already, uh, the ISAE 3000, uh, that looks at the, the non-financial information. Um, but uh, I would imagine uh, this is something that would be rapidly uh, developing uh, over the next uh, couple of years. Um, and I mentioned the September 2020 report uh, by the IBC and the efforts uh, by the five um, uh, entities uh, to come up with uh, some sort of standards and at the very least, uh, some reporting metrics uh, to then take it. Um, so if I may, uh, Brinda, uh, just this morning, I uh, texted uh, the uh, managing partners and chairman of the big four firms uh, here in Malaysia. Uh, so, uh, you know, our uh, Mr. G uh, from Deloitte, um, Dr. Ralph from EY, uh, Dr. Johan from KPMG, and uh, uh, Dr. Faiz Azmi from PRBC uh, on some of their thoughts. And uh, I think they all shared the, their uh, perspectives that uh, yes, this is something that uh, will happen. And, and I think it will happen faster than uh, we thought. Thank you. Okay. And um, let's just move a little bit to some a question that has is comparing uh, the Islamic perspective as well. And um, is there any difference between ESG from an Islamic perspective and from versus the conventional perspective. And uh, this, uh, this question goes on to say, we do know that ESG is somehow already embedded in the Islamic principles, but um, the um, participant would just like to seek your views or whether there will be an IESG standard uh, that may be coming up uh, which looks at purely how you can achieve the ESG initiatives from the perspective of Islamic finance. Um, so that's the question. Well, uh, thank you. Um, when, uh, during my speech just now, uh, I mentioned the fact that uh, if you were to observe uh, the five uh, objectives of uh, Makassid uh, Sharia, uh, it becomes very clear uh, that uh, the objectives of uh, Sharia uh, is uh, they are very consistent with uh, the principles of sustainability, uh, and it covered the, the three main areas of um, environmental, social issues, and governance uh, issues as well. Um, so uh, the only um, difference to me uh, would be uh, in terms of uh, elements of faith, uh, if, if I may, uh, in terms of what are the activities uh, which are Sharia compliant and which are not. Uh, so for example, um, I would just like to use the FUSI for, for good constituents vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the FUSI for good Sharia uh, index constituents that we have. Uh, so as you know, currently uh, we have 76 constituents uh, of uh, the FUSI for good Sharia uh, index. Um, and from there, uh, we then screen uh, those companies uh, from a Sharia perspective. Uh, that means that um, if they are involved in conventional banking, for example, if they are involved in um, uh, liquor uh, production, so they will not be uh, Sharia compliant. So from that uh, 26, 71% uh, of them are actually Sharia compliant. And so that's actually uh, 54 counters, uh, if I may. But having said that, uh, I think uh, growingly, uh, you will also find that uh, that gap will uh, narrow. Uh, eventually. Uh, so I'll give you one example uh, on alcohol. Uh, so currently, uh, so companies like Heineken, for example, uh, they're actually uh, in our food safe for good, uh, although they are non-sure compliant. But if you look at uh, many views globally, uh, they have uh, become, uh, they have started to view uh, alcohol production as non-consistent with 14 of the 17 uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, and therefore, uh, if that's actually the case, um, I think eventually uh, alcohol production will also drop off uh, from the sustainability um, you know, criteria as well. So meaning that um, so companies that are engaged in uh, alcohol production, for example, uh, will not uh, be classified as sustainable uh, in the future, I think. Thank you. And um, 
follow up with the next one is another question again. As you know, there are different participants and different views. Uh, this question just says, what, what do you think is the corporate's real intention in focusing on ESG in their business operations? So is it because of the trend, the regulation, regulation or regulatory aspect or sincerity to prosper together with the community and the planet? So that's the question, Tanshri. Well, uh, Verinda, I always believe in every single person uh, wanting to be a good person. So uh, in Malay, we call it bersangka uh, in a sense. Um, so that means that I think um, if um, you have a choice, every single company uh, would also want to do good. Um, but having said that, um, I think they will have uh, priorities. And they also need to know uh, what does it take uh, to do good and to be good. Now, for the moment, uh, sustainability being a relatively new uh, you know, a concept and new issue, uh, a lot of companies are trying to understand better. And for the moment, many, many of them are looking at it from a compliance perspective. Uh, not that they don't believe in it, but it's just that uh, the comprehension level may be not as high yet, um, and therefore, um, uh, what they do now is actually busy looking at uh, from a compliance perspective. Uh, my view is that over time, as uh, the comprehension level uh, increases, uh, so naturally um, they will truly embed uh, all the elements of sustainability uh, in their strategy and in their business operations. So I mentioned earlier that uh, you know, from a governance perspective, uh, there is no choice, right? Because every single board will be required to make sure that the elements of uh, sustainability uh, will be embedded in the uh, strategy and business operations. Um, so no longer just a purely risk issue, but it must be truly embedded. Um, and therefore, uh, it's something which um, uh, I think all companies will take uh, seriously. And, and uh, again, it's a matter of comprehension. So I, I hope you don't mind. Uh, my lecture earlier was a bit long because I felt it was necessary to provide that big picture uh, about the global climate change movement uh, beyond just the corporate uh, side. Um, so again, uh, we will continue to do this. And I think it's actually very important to make sure that people understand uh, what you mean by being carbon uh, neutral, uh, what is net zero. Uh, so what are the contributors, uh, the energy mix, uh, what can we do then uh, to um, arrive at the net um, zero uh, position? Uh, what's the role of our uh, forests, um, the carbon sink? So uh, I think, for example, uh, even for me personally, uh, I never realized uh, the importance of our forest cover. A and 75% of our current emissions uh, actually can be covered uh, or negated by our uh, forest. And that's 18.2 uh, million uh, that we have currently. So we do hope that um, we'll find ways how we can actually preserve this forest uh, because they are, you know, extremely useful resources for us to be able to achieve net zero. Yes. I, I think um, you're, you're right, Antri. I mean, your presentation was uh, holistic in a way, and that's what I like presentations to be, where it frames the discussion uh, from one end to the end so that you are fully aware of all the aspects and not just highlight one particular uh, area and then do not see how it falls into place. So in that sense, uh, no issues with uh, the length of the presentation, it was good. I just wanted to remind uh, all the participants that uh, I, I, do, I do realize that looking at the slides may not be easy on this virtual platform, but we will be, we've got the permission of Transfer Wahid to share the slides. And uh, this will be placed also on our website, the www.micpa.com.my. From tomorrow onwards, there is a special commemorative uh, lecture page, and you can access it as well. Now, Tanshri, just, let's just continue a few more questions. Um, one of the um, questions we received, uh, I think is alluding to what you just said, uh, perhaps I'll be repeating it, repeating myself, but never mind. That's, this is a question as asked question. The point was a lot of initiatives uh, are regulatory driven. Uh, if you look at everything else, 
uh, sustainability, integrated reporting, and, uh, and range of climate change, ESG, and uh, rather than being industry driven. So question is, how could we push the industry to be more active? I suppose it's, it's a process, but perhaps your thoughts on this, Anshu. Yeah, so if I may, uh, very true, a lot of it has been driven uh, by uh, regulators and so on. But uh, if you remember how it started, it actually started with um, groups of people uh, with common beliefs uh, wanting to do uh, better. So the UNPRI, for example, it started with a group of institutional uh, investors uh, getting together, uh, of course, under the auspices of the uh, United Nations Environment Programme. Uh, but the fact remains that you have this group of uh, you know, business or investors um, grouping together and wanting to develop uh, some uh, principles uh, for them to invest in sustainably. Um, and likewise, um, within the context of the World Economic Forum, again, uh, they're not regulators, but they're just a group of uh, business people, and they form this International Business Council, and again, uh, they got together, and they roped in the four, uh, the big four firms uh, to come up with the uh, reporting metrics, um, again, uh, and hopefully uh, that will uh, be the basis for further discussions, and uh, some of them uh, will probably end up uh, as being uh, adopted as standards uh, probably later. Um, so uh, even uh, in Malaysia, for example, um, I highlighted the issue about the, um, the, um, the modern slavery and the forced labor practices. Now, you see, in the past, many of our companies, uh, whether it's plantation companies or uh, manufacturing companies, um, so when we hired these people, these people would have been brought in by the agents. Uh, two agents, one in the exporting country and um, one in the home country, uh, host country. Um, and the moment uh, they land at our uh, company's premises, that becomes our responsibility. We look after them well, we pay them and so on. So, so in the past, uh, we could ignore what happened to them before that. But I'm afraid, that stance is no longer valid because today's um, ILO uh, provisions, the international rights uh, you know, people are now demanding that companies take into account how these people have been sourced. So uh, meaning that although uh, you know, these uh, foreign workers will have to, to go through the foreign agents, uh, it is our responsibility now to make sure that the fees that that they paid uh, are actually reasonable and they should not uh, and any longer be bonded, uh, for example. Um, and, and that's why uh, nowadays, um, so whether you're manufacturer, uh, glove companies and electronics uh, companies uh, alike, uh, plantation companies will have to take into account all these things because if you don't, um, you'll end up being held accountable. Um, so, although not directly, uh, but indirectly, uh, therefore, as companies, we will have to start uh, lobbying with our government uh, to make sure that all these uh, labor policies and practices will be addressed accordingly. Uh, so, we can no longer sit there quietly uh, and ignore all these things. We have to take action um, and work with every single party, including the government, uh, to address this major issue. As you know, this um, US tier three uh, trafficking in persons, um, you know, cheering, uh, it is a major issue that uh, we need to address. And advice on the other matters as well. Thank you. Yeah, you're right, you're right. But, um, as, as, as you had shared in your presentation, the UK government has set bold ambitions and is driving the ESG agenda. So the question here is, do you think that the government of Malaysia is doing enough? All their resources uh, in the past uh, for their economic gains. Um, and they have uh, better means uh, to pursue many of the sustainability efforts. Um, so for the developing countries, so obviously there naturally there'll be some handicaps there. But having said that, uh, within the context of uh, what we can do, uh, I'm actually seeing great uh, progress. 
uh, in our country's commitment towards um, net zero, for example. Um, and uh, I think uh, you've seen this uh, in the formation of the Climate Action Council, for example, uh, that's chaired by the Prime Minister himself. Um, and uh, I know that the people in CASA and uh, KETSA, uh, for example, they're actually working hard uh, to address all these issues, uh, looking at uh, the energy mix, uh, for example. Um, in the financial services industry, naturally, Bandagara, SC, uh, have been very, very uh, uh, you know, forceful and at the forefront of driving the financial institutions and the uh, securities industry uh, to really embrace sustainability. Um, and my view is actually, if you look at uh, the whole um, um, the whole of society kind of approach uh, being undertaken, uh, I think is um, is great encouragement. I would say, um, and I'm sure we'll get there. Um, so I think we all have to play our part. So this is where, uh, if you don't mind, I, mean, I highlighted the work being done by WWF Malaysia and BCG uh, in terms of determining uh, what are the possible pathways for net zero. Um, and this is uh, something that will require the support of uh, every single corporate. So we're engaging with uh, the uh, CEO Action uh, Network, um, uh, for example, uh, the CGN and uh, every single uh, party in the corporate sector uh, to come and support this. And uh, together, uh, let's find um, the appropriate pathway uh, for Malaysia to achieve uh, net zero. Um, and I know, uh, the, the default position is now is by 2065, uh, but um, we should see whether we can uh, work together and find uh, and accelerate that towards 2050. And again, why are we doing this? Uh, well, uh, I think um, we are doing this apart from the greater good of mankind, uh, but it's also uh, for the greater good of all of us, because if you were to ignore this, um, you will be to our detriment, if I may. Yeah, our planet itself will be impacted as well. So, so connected to that, there is one question coming from uh, on a regulatory perspective as well. Uh, to what extent would ESG reporting become mandatory instead of voluntary uh, as part of the ways uh, forward in terms of encouraging us to have reached a global net zero emissions by 2050? So that's naturally some of the some of the thought process people may have about uh, compulsion as voluntarism. So I'm not sure whether you believe that there should be um, mandatory exercise of, of such standards. Well, uh, eventually uh, it will be. Uh, so I think uh, the idea would be to um, enhance education, to uh, do more advocacy. Uh, and get uh, corporates to comply uh, on a voluntary basis. Um, as you know, we are doing a lot uh, at Bursa Malaysia to guide um, and to assist our PLCs uh, in terms of uh, the accessibility reports. Uh, but um, and over time, um, as you can see from the uh, MCCG itself, um, over time, uh, all this uh, reporting uh, will be uh, mandatory eventually. Um, so it's a matter of uh, how or what form it takes, and, and that's something that we all have to develop together. Uh, so I would imagine uh, all the audit firms uh, will certainly be hooked in significantly uh, into the process. Yes, in fact, uh, the audit firms already have divisions and partners who are who are leading this uh, particular initiatives on climate and ESG. So. So they, they, are the, they are the first movers from the profession point of view. And ultimately, the question is the rest of our accountants, uh, how do they move forward? So this, this is connected to a question, which is, is quite a simple one, but it says, what could be the, I think in many ways you've answered it on street, but maybe we'll try to uh, address this specifically. What could be possible catalysts to enable accountants to help businesses embed ESG into the daily business operations? Yeah, so um, I think accountants are naturally positioned uh, in that sense, uh, because uh, we are responsible to, uh, in, in our basic function as an accountant, we are supposed to actually record every single transaction um, that happens uh, across uh, the organization, right? So I'm reminded of my 
uh, initial role uh, as an accountant, as a vice president of finance and treasury, uh, drawing up the accounts, uh, and then uh, you uh, present uh, the management report um, and you get invited to the board. Um, and naturally, uh, from just financials, it goes into strategy, uh, then later when you have risk management, so that gets expanded uh, to cover risk management as well. Um, and now, uh, in the future, naturally, uh, elements of sustainability, ESG, uh, will come into play as well. So as the central person or function in every single organization, um, it's just a natural role for accountants uh, or CFOs uh, to actually assume uh, that role. Um, and, and to me, um, we, we're blessed in the sense that uh, we've got that trust uh, to be at the center of every single organization. And uh, even uh, for all the boards that I uh, chair or where I am a member of, uh, I always encourage um, the CFO um, to be involved uh, in most of the deliberations. Uh, and naturally, uh, given the emphasis on standards, on numbers, um, you know, uh, I think um, the reports um, generated by uh, accountants are typically uh, precise, concise, um, and um, holistic too, if I may. So I have no doubt that the accountants would be the right um, group of people uh, to uh, carry out this function. And, um, and I'm sure because uh, some tools and templates have already been uh, developed, uh, and some are already available. The World Economic Forum did put out some kind of a template in terms of climate change. So I think the challenge for everyone is to acquire the knowledge and the awareness and then take it forward and apply it to in the context of their business, in the context of their clients. So, the, as you said, Tantri, the role of accountants actually cannot be just simply to deliver a product. Um, it is also incumbent on us to educate our clients, our potential clients, so that they take on board some of the initiatives that should be taken on board to make the business more sustainable. I think that's the underlying uh, message that, in that, that uh, you have uh, uh, trying to deliver to our accountants to say that it's not about uh, embedding it into one report and just say this is and deliver a report, but it's also an encouragement and, and uh, a learning process that we ourselves as accountants need to share with our clients. So I think that's, that's, that's the philosophical aspect and that's where uh, professional body and MyCPA have to play the role in terms of sharing the product, sharing the tools, giving all our members greater awareness so that they have a, um, a place where they can access the, all the various types of articles, tools, and so on, and perhaps then be able to deliver quality service. Perhaps one last question since I am, uh, we are conscious of the interest of time. Uh, just one last question is really on the environmental aspects. Um, I think we have the ESG, the social part you've uh, alluded to as well in terms of workers' housing, how workers' treatment is there's one of those aspects. Governance uh, in terms of boards. Uh, this aspect is about the E part, which is the environmental issues. Now, the point here is that environmental issues have been taken very seriously in the developed nations. However, in the developing nations, we tend to find that um, even though we policies to encourage our products or services to be environmentally friendly. But in practice, we never really push for, for solid implementation of these types of practices or, or suggestions or guides. And so the question is, how can we address this issue in terms of environmental degradation that does occur even, I mean, to this day? Transfer. Yeah, um, again, the, my view is, is that it is very much related to the development of the country and society. So naturally, uh, for countries that are more developed, uh, you have a greater uh, you know, a civil society, if I may, um, and uh, the income level is actually higher uh, to therefore pay a lot more attention on issues of environment, environmental uh, issues as opposed to the day-to-day 
uh, in a struggle uh, to actually uh, put the food on the table and so on. Uh, now, naturally, um, over time, uh, I would expect uh, Malaysia to progress uh, too. Uh, my view is that we have all the laws uh, already in place. Uh, the challenge has always been how it's actually enforced. And I think, um, again, my view is actually sometimes you just can't rely on enforcers to enforce the law. Uh, you need the society uh, to actually be more responsible uh, and uh, to watch over each other to make sure that we all uh, do our part. So I, I, if I can give you one simple example uh, in terms of um, uh, waste separation, right? Uh, you know, Malaysians, uh, we probably have the highest uh, waste um, per capita. And uh, there's a lot of uh, water, uh, for example, water content in our waste, uh, we don't separate. Now, there's already laws. Um, so the local councils have already uh, put into place uh, the laws, right? Um, so we are supposed to actually do it, but I think the majority of households are still not segregating their waste uh, according to what's recyclable, what's food waste, and what's um, uh, you know, uh, plastic and, and so on. Um, so uh, my view is actually it all starts from every single one of us uh, to do our respective part. Uh, but uh, of course, um, as we progress, uh, the more developed we become, uh, the more civic minded um, our people will become, and hopefully uh, will be sooner uh, rather than later. And my view is actually this crisis has pushed a lot of us uh, to think um, and to care more for the environment. Uh, and hopefully uh, things will get a lot better and faster uh, over the next uh, few years of coming. Okay, I think Tan Sri, there was a, a good summation in terms of what we should be doing as individuals as well, because it actually comes from the heart. We need to understand what should be done and we cannot be waiting to be always um, have the big stick being applied to, to us to force us to do what we want. But you need a big stick at times. Um, but at the same time, you need to have solid education and awareness. And that's where private and public sector plays a part. Uh, and then the next aspect is about giving investors uh, um, the relevant types of reporting, giving um, uh, companies the tools that they can use to report what they need to report in terms of uh, what investors want and then making the right decisions accordingly and so on and so forth. So I think the conclusion, I just like to thank you again for your time and, um, and the lecture that you gave us on a very uh, relevant topical current uh, uh, issues in terms of ESG, Islamic finance and, and, and the relevant uh, aspects in terms of climate change and so on and how accountants can play a role in this particular area. So again, I thank you very much, Tanshri Wahid, uh, and uh, we look forward to some future engagements as well, uh, because I'm sure the MICPA is also planning some aspects uh, in some types of initiatives on ESG, climate change, and so on, and sharing with our fellow accountants uh, on such developments. So thank you very much, and, uh, and uh, can I pass this over to well, the... Thank Thank you, Verinda. Uh, if I may, for this invitation, it's indeed my honor to be here. And if I may uh, request that you know, all of us will have to do our part uh, in being constructive uh, and try to do what we can to make uh, not just um, the country of ours, but also the whole world to be a better place, uh, inshallah. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you.